We've looked at using calculus to find stationary points, and we know the most interesting or useful kinds of stationary points are usually ones where there are turning points. Turning points, of course, fall into two categories, where you're turning and you're concave down, which means you're a maximum, or you're turning and you're concave up, which means you're a minimum. Okay? So we looked in abstract at finding the maximum value of a function, some magical, weird function that you have no idea what it refers to. But now we want to actually apply this to specific problems where you've got actual quantities that our x's and y's and s's and t's that they actually refer to. So this is a pretty classic example. Okay? You've got a rectangle with a given length. They just provide a pronumeral for you, though it's worth mentioning if they don't provide a pronumeral for you, sometimes you've got to define it yourself. They tell you it's got a constant area of 36 square centimeters, a constant area of 36 square centimeters, which kind of clues you into the fact that the other thing that's there, the other quantity, is not constant. It can vary, it can change. Okay? And the question is very simple. What's the smallest perimeter? What's the minimum uh, perimeter we can find for this rectangle? Now, I've got four steps for you, and we're going to work through each one. They each require a bit of thought, but if you've got the four steps down, I think you'll be, you'll be all right. Um, the four steps stand for, and if you can think of a better acronym than I can, then go for it, uh, model, Look for restrictions, use calculus, and then actually answer the question. Okay? Create a model of the situation, which is generally going to be some kind of equation we can differentiate. Once you've created that model, look carefully and see whether there are any restrictions that apply to the model. The reason why you do that straight away is because once you get on the calculus train, you get so like into the pattern that you forget that there are restrictions that apply. You just kind of think of them as, as letters that move around. And it's a classic problem that people, uh, that students make, uh, an error, that they forget their restrictions, they get answers out of the calculus and don't actually think about what they mean. Then you do your differentiating, find your max or min as relevant, and once you find that, go back to the question and have a look at what the question's actually asking. Make sure you answer it, okay? Model restrictions, calculus, answer. Let's have a go. Now, to create the model, I want to use all the information that's been provided to me in the question. There's a rectangle with length x. So the first thing I'm going to do, not that you have to do this, but I don't know why you wouldn't, is I'm going to draw the thing. Here is my rectangle, okay? Now, if you've got a rectangle and it has length x, then its width is going to be based on its area, right? Because you also know its area. Um, the area of a rectangle, of course, is length times width. So just looking at that, can you tell me what the width of this rectangle should be? Because remember, I should multiply these together. Yeah, so if I multiply these together to get 36, then it stands to reason that this is 36 on x. Does that make sense? Multiply them together just to check. Yes, you're going to get 36. Fine. So I've got the dimensions of my rectangle. Okay. This is part of my model, by the way. I'm just I'm creating it as I go. Now, the area is what I use to find these dimensions here. But what I'm actually trying to get toward is this perimeter. right? I'm trying to minimize perimeter, which means I need the perimeter as a function of the variables that I've got. Right? So I'm going to write p for perimeter equals, and look, I just have to add all these things up. Right? So you can see it's going to be 2x plus, when you add 36 on x to 36 on x, you're going to get 72 on x. Yeah? Okay, how are you going so far? Does that make sense? That wasn't too arduous. Right? I probably should have said let the perimeter be p, but you guys get what I'm doing here. Okay? So I've pretty much created my model now. Right? Um, this, this entire thing that I've written constitutes my model. It demonstrates what's going on here and allows me to work with what's going on. So after I create my model, what's my next step? Look for restrictions. Okay? So x, which is the variable, it can't just be anything you like. Right? There are restrictions that are implied in the question. Would anyone like to suggest some to me? x has to be greater than 0. x is a length. Right? So therefore the length has to be positive. So I can say right over here that x has to be greater than 0. Can x be equal to 0? No. Not if you wanted a rectangle with actual area. right? Is there an upper boundary? Like x can't be any bigger than this. If x got really, really big, like say 100 centimeters or something like that, super long thing, could you still create a rectangle with the appropriate width to give it the area that it's supposed to have. 
you, you could, right? It would be really long, it would just be very, very thin, right? So I can keep on doing that infinitely. I can't do that with an actual piece of paper and a rectangle, but I can do that mathematically, right? So therefore, there's no upper bound around this. That's the only restriction. So models ready, restrictions done. Now I'm gonna start doing calculus. I'm looking for a minimum. So what am I gonna to do to this expression here? I'm going to go to the first derivative, right? Um, I've said before that I don't like the, you know, the y dash notation because it, it sort of eliminates what's going on here. There's not, this is not a function of y, it's, it's capital P. So I'm gonna write dP on dx. Right? So this is where this notation starts to come into its own because it tells you exactly what you're differentiating and what you're differentiating with respect to. Okay, you can differentiate for me. What am I going to get? This is going to give me 2. And then this is actually 72x to the negative 1. So the negative will come out the front. Uh, I multiply by that. And then the power reduces by 1, which is x to the negative 2. So that's actually down here. Is that okay? You all right with that? Okay, fantastic. So this is the derivative. What do I do with it? Why did I bother differentiating? I need to find the minimum. So the minimum is most likely to occur at a stationary point, right? Uh, it's worth mentioning all that stuff we said last time about endpoints and what have you uh, also have to be considered. However, in this, in this case, this actual question, I know the endpoints are irrelevant. Can anyone tell me why? Have a look carefully at the question. What are the endpoints? Now, this is a bit weird. It's a bit of a trick question because um, there are, in fact, no endpoints. Can you see why? Think about it. Think about, like, what's the lowest that x can be? Think of a number. And you can't actually think of a number, right? Because if I said, oh, 0 0.1 is the lowest, well, you can have it 0 0.01 if you want or 0 0.001. You can keep on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You, of course, we established before, you can't actually get to 0. So that's not an endpoint. And we also explain you can't go any further in that direction. Well, sorry, you can go as far as you like in that direction. There's no endpoint over that end. So it doesn't actually have endpoints. But often, this is where the endpoints come from. That might be worth writing down. This is where endpoints are from. Because you only get them where there's some kind of domain restriction, right? So all of that just to say, re-emphasize, yes, I'm looking for my stationary points. 